Thanks, Yana, for your kind presentation and welcome everyone to this webinar on the question and answer document which supports the ICHM7 assessment. In this webinar, we'll review the recommendations included in this ICH questionnaire. These recommendations aim to facilitate the implementation of the M7 guideline and therefore to improve the quality of risk analysis for mutagenic impurities. Before starting with a review of the document, let's see the most important dates in the development of this guideline. The M7 guideline was adopted by ICH in 2014, and the first addendum was released three years later. A maintenance process is currently being done to incorporate acceptable limits, such as PDEs or acceptable intakes, for new mutagenic impurities. Furthermore, a question and answer document has been developed to clarify some quality and sa safety aspects and concerns identified through the implementation of the M7 guideline. This Q&A document was published in June 2020 and contains additional clarification to some aspects which led to variable interpretation by stakeholders, and that is why we are going to review it in this webinar. As seen in the slide, the question and answer document is structured in different sections that fully match with the M7 guideline. In this webinar, we'll briefly review the ideas of the M7 guideline and then we'll see the new ideas in the Q&A document. From my side, I'll review the first four sections as well as the risk characterization and control strategies sections. And Dr. Sayakov will review general principles and hazard assessment sections as well as first question in section 9. And um, well, sections 5, 10 and 11 of the M7 guideline have not been modified in the Q&A document, so they will be only briefly reviewed. So let's start with the introduction. As everyone knows, M7 is focused on the control of mutagenic impurities that may be present in either drug substance or drug product. The control of mutagenic impurities is crucial since this type of compounds are active at very low doses and in a worst case scenario they could produce carcinogenic processes. An example of this type of impurities are the nitrosamines found in some sartans containing a tetrasol group. Nitrosodimethylamine or nitrosodiethylamine are mutagenic impurities active at very low levels and can compromise the health of the patient, thus the need for their strict control. The first question included in the Q&A document deals with the differences between mutagenicity and genotoxicity potential. Mutagenicity refers to the alteration of the DNA base sequence. Meanwhile, genotoxicity can be defined as the ability to cause damage to genetic material and chromosomes. Genotoxicity is a more complex process that can occur due to mutagenic processes or for indirect mechanisms such as, for example, the alteration of the enzymes involved in replication. Mutagenic impurities are active at very low doses, thus the M7 guideline focuses specifically on them. The second question refers to the evaluation of impurities present at or below 1 mg. According to the Q&A document, QSAR is considered appropriate for the evaluation. Indeed, negative QSAR results could classify an impurity under class 5, which are non-mutagenic impurities. It is important to note that impurities should not be classified based only on the, on the absence of structural alerts by visual evaluation alone. QSAR methods uh, should be always performed, as acknowledged in the article. The third question refers to the need for additional studies when QSAR predictions are negative. According to the question and answer document, it is not necessary to perform any additional tests if the QSAR results are negative. That is, the impurity could be directly classified as non-mutagenic as long as QSAR results are negative and performed with a validated method. For impurities present above 1 mg in the daily dose in chronic exposure products, uh, well, in these cases, genotoxicity studies are encouraged. For example, the AIMS test or the chromosomal aberration test 
could be considered. This scenario could occur in drug products with high maximum doses and long-term administration where even a low percentage of impurity would represent more than 1 mg. In relation to the scope of the guideline, um, M7 applies for new drug substances and new drug products during their clinical development and subsequent applications for marketing. For a ready market products, um, if any change could affect the risk level, then uh, an ICHM7 assessment should be performed. And um, well, important point to remember, this guideline do not apply for um, some products such as biological products, peptides, ra radio pharmaceuticals, or fermentation products, among others. For semi-synthetic drug substances, a risk assessment is needed in case that manufacturing steps could introduce mutagenic impurities. As an example, post-modification steps in semi-synthetic anti antibiotics could represent a source of mutagenic impurities. So, in this case, an ICHM7 assessment should be performed. So, let's continue to section 4. In relation to considerations for marketed products, the first idea to keep in mind is that ICHM7 apply for products marketed before the adoption of this guideline. However, some changes in drug substance or drug product, chemistry or manufacturing processes may require further revision through an ICHM7 assessment. Additionally, those mutagenic impurities controlled through less than lifetime adjust adjustment, uh, that is um, with 120, 20 or 10 micrograms per day, may no longer be appropriate if the duration of treatment is, is extended. In section 4, as for considerations for marketed products, um, any increase in dose of the active pharmaceutical ingredient that would increase any mutagenic impurity to levels above the acceptable limits is considered significant and thus should be re-evaluated under an ICHM7 assessment. Let's move on to section 5. Um, all those, although this section has not been modified in the questionnaire, we will briefly review ICH proposal for impurities identification. Uh, well, according to ICHM7, impurities can be classified into actual and potential impurities, depending on whether they have been identified or it is only suspected that they could be formed. Um, in addition, they are classified into synthetic and degradation impurities, depending on the mechanisms by which they are formed. Therefore, to carry out an exhaustive and reliable risk analysis of mutagenic impurities, the expert who makes the report should propose all the synthetic and degradation impurities, both actual and potential, that appear or could appear in the product. This first step of identifying impurities is crucial for a good risk analysis. From the list of proposed impurities, the mutagenic potential and the control strategies of each of them will be reviewed in the following sections. So, once we know which is the toxicity profile of impurity under evaluation, we should propose a toxicological limit for it, especially, um, especially when we are facing a mutagenic impurity. This step is called risk characterization. So, um, if our impurity is mutagenic or it is suspected to be mutagenic, such as compounds in class 3, but no additional data is available, then we can use the TTC value. The TTC value corresponds to 1.5 micrograms per day and represents an acceptable intake for any unstudied chemical that poses a marginal, a very low risk of cancer. The TTC-based acceptable intake is protected for a lifetime, considering an average of 70 years of like life expectancy. However, for short-term treatments, higher intakes of mutagenic impurities could still maintain comparable risk levels. For example, impurities in any drug product used in emergency procedures could have an acceptable intake of 120 micrograms. Meanwhile, drug products used in chronic exposure, such as hypertension, 
would have an acceptable intake of 1.5 micrograms per day. It is important to note that for high potency mutagenic compounds such as aflatoxins or nitroso compounds, thresholds lower than TTC are generally required. Well, and then um, when mutagenic impurities are also carcinogenic compounds, acceptable intakes can be proposed from carcinogenicity data. So TD50 values or no IL values can be used as point of departure for an acceptable intake calculation. Different scenarios are proposed in this Q&A document for risk characterization. In the first question, an AIMS positive result with negative in vivo test is proposed. In this case, if the result of the in vivo study are clearly negative, the impurity can be directly allocated to ICHM7 class 5. And then, of course, it would be um, um, uh, ICHQ3A or ICHQ3B specifications would apply for the, its control. It is important to note that the in vivo study should be well conducted and scientifically justified. Then a second scenario is proposed in which both the AIMS test and the in vivo test provide a positive result. So how, um, how could we calculate an acceptable intake in this case? Um, well, um, in vivo gene mutation says are not validated to directly assess cancer risk. In fact, no TD50 values or no IL values are identified in gene mutation tests. Thus, no specific acceptable intakes can be calculated in this case, so TTC value or um, less than lifetime uh, time adjustment shall be used as control threshold for these impurities. Next question refers to the extrapolation of acceptable intakes from lifetime exposure to short-term exposure. Um, well, although for TTC value this approach is fully admitted, um, this idea cannot be directly migrated for acceptable intakes calculated from toxicological values such as no oil or TD50 values. A case-by-case -case assessment considering patient's population, administration routes or mechanisms of elimination of the impurity should be considered to adjust any acceptable intake to short-term exposure. Um, next question specifically refers to the treatments for human immunodeficiency virus for which the duration of treatment has increased as the life expectancy of the patients has increased too. So 1.5 is the new threshold that should be used for mutagenic impurities in these products. Well, there is an ex exception um, with currently marked products for which 10 micrograms per day still applies in order to avoid disruption of supply. And well, also the acceptable intake remains at 10 micrograms per day in cases where the drug substance is produced by the same supplier of an existing drug product already marked. Finally, um, when there are um, more than three mutagenic impurities, they should be controlled both individually and altogether. A limit for each individual impurity should be included in the drug substance specification. And additionally, a limit for total mutagenic impurities should be listed in the drug substance specification. Um, well, for mutagenic impurities with a TTC threshold, the table in the slide summarizes the limits for multiple um, impurities. Um, and well, mutagenic impurities with an acceptable intake threshold are they are excluded from total mutagenic impurity limits. So, for these impurities, we should only report individual limits. So, let's move on to control strategies section. Okay, once we have proposed a specification or limit for the mutagenic impurity, we should define how we are going to control it. According to ICHM7 guideline, there are four options to control mutagenic impurities. The most challenging is option one, which includes a test for the impurity in the drug substance with an acceptance criterion um, at or below the acceptable limit. Well, in option, option two, the impurity 
uh, can be controlled in raw materials intermediates or as um, in process control. Option 3 also allows testing in raw material or intermediates, but in this case the acceptance criterion may be above the acceptable limits providing that the removal of impurity is confirmed. Um, well, option four is just a non-testing strategy, strategy which um, should be applied specifically for purgeable impurities. For this option, it is necessary to fully understand process parameters to confirm that the level of impurity in the drug substance will be below the acceptable limit. So let's see what the Q&A document says about control strategies. So, um, when is it appropriate to use an option 4 control strategy? Well, option 4 can be used when there is a very low risk that the mutagenic impurity is in the final drug substance. Um, this rationale should be demonstrated by different strategies, such as um, scientific pr principles, um, calculated purge factors, measured purge factors, or even better, combination of all these approaches. Um, scientific principles may be suitable when there is sufficient data to conclude that the mutagenic impurity is unstable and will not appear in the product. An example could be thionyl chloride, which is a mutagenic impurity which quickly reacts with water to form sulfur dioxide and hydrochloric acid. On the other hand, the term purge factor refers to the concentration of mutagenic impurity before and after the purge process. These purge factors can either be calculated from different parameters, uh, well, we see, we'll see them later, or analytically measured. To verify analytically that the impurity disappears, we can carry out spike studies. These studies consist of intentionally adding large quantities of impurity in order to verify that, in fact, the impurity is purified throughout the process. Um, the second question of these sections refer to the calculated purge factors for option 4. Um, when we calculate purge factors, we should always consider parameters of the metagenic impurity, such as reactivity, solubility or volatility. Additionally, parameters of the manufacturing process, such as purification steps, should be also considered. According to the Q&A document, an example of predictive purge calculation has been described in the publication so in the slide. In any case, um, purge calculations should be properly justified and experimental data on reactivity, on solubility or even analytical data from speaking tests may be required, specifically when the impurity under evaluation approaches the TTC limit. Next question in the Q&A document refers to the potential mutagenic impurities introduced in the last synthetic step. This scenario is the riskiest one since um, mutagenic impurities are very close to the final product. Thus, it is recommended to use a control strategy 1. Um, well, control strategies 2 and 3 um, could be used, for example, when the crude drug substance is purified subsequently by efficient processes such as um, recrystallization or chromatographic purification. And of course, um, option 4 is not recommended at all. It would only be encouraged for highly reactive species such as um, thionyl chloride again or um, materials with low boiling points. The following question referred to the periodic verification testing for options 2 and 3. According to the Q&A document, this is only applicable as a control strategy for option 1, that is, um, when the specifications are set for drug substance. So, periodic verification is not appropriate for option 2 and 3. In other words, if testing is proposed for intermediates or for raw materials, verification testing won't be encouraged. Next question refers to the possibility of avoiding testing when in process controls shows an amount of impurity of less than 30% of the TTC. 
Well, based on the Q&A document, it is not sufficient to justify no testing of the impurity. However, if we can prove a very low risk of the impurity to be present in the drug substance, an option for control strategy may be considered. Interestingly, um, according to the recently published Q&A document for nitrosamines, amounts of impurity below uh, than 30% of the acceptable limit would justify skip testing. Furthermore, less than 10% of the acceptable limit would justify an omission of specification. Therefore, um, there is a kind of um, a special consideration for nitrosamine-like mutagenic impurities. And last question in control strategy sections deals about the scale considerations for the analytical experiments for control strategies 3 and 4. A studies should consider <coughs> sorry, the potential impact of scale and equipment and the differences between laboratory and production environment. In the case we observe scale dependencies, um, well, it may be advisable to perform um, confirmatory testing on batches manufactured at pilot or commercial scale. And finally, the Q&A document provides some recommendations to improve the clarity of the ICHM7 risk assessment. According to the questionnaire, Module 2 should include just a brief summary of both the risk assessment and the control strategies. Module 3 should include the ICHM7 risk assessment and control strategies provided in full detail. And well, safety information on the impurities, such as um, in vitro tests or QSAR analysis, should be placed in Module 4. So, here ends the revision of the update of the ICHM7 guideline. As we have seen, the QA document is very comprehensive and solves many doubts that have arisen in all these years since ICHM7 was released. Thanks to this questionnaire, the nitrosamines risk analysis will have greater reliability, thus increasing the quality of the product and the safety of the patient. So thank you uh, for your kind attention and now I give the floor to Jana. Thanks, Victoria. And our next presenter is uh, Dr. Brustom Saikov, who is the president of Multicase since 2012. He joined Multicase in 2000 as a computational scientist and in a few years was appointed to vice president of research and development and shortly after became chief operating officer. A native of Russia, in 1991, Rustam was awarded a PhD through Kazan University, which is the third oldest university of the Russian Federation. He has over 20 years experience in teaching and research in areas of expertise, which include chem informatics, molecular modeling, QSAR, organic and computational chemistry, and finally, computational toxicology. And in the past few years, Dr. Sykov has been involved directly for multi-case risk assessment and safety consulting services. Dr. Sykov also has been the principal investigator of several grant projects and has over 100 scientific presentations and publications. So with that, I'm happy to pass it over to Dr. Rustam Saikov, who will be presenting the second part of this session on Q&A. Thank you, Gianna, for your kind presentation. Let me start the presentation and let me start my timer. Okay, so hello everyone. I'm going to finish what Victoria started in her beautiful presentation. Uh, well, you see the pictures again, and I think I don't need to clarify who is who, but just in case, I'm the guy on the left. Since I'm dealing with QSR for my entire life, I will be talking about QSR, so that pretty much will be touching the parts 3, 6, and a little bit of part 9. And just because of the nature of this um, event, it's an essentially joint presentation. So many sub-slides and some examples in this presentation were developed and 
contributed by Dr. Prado. So I have to acknowledge that. And finally, as one more acknowledgement, um, whatever I'm going to say today, it should not be considered as regulatory advice. It's just my opinion, which um, was developed with years of experience and years of dealing with M7. So just take it just like this. Well, major question about M7, at least those people who are dealing with software and QSAR, in the end, you want to know which class of M7 compound your impurity is. Is it one, two, three, which is bad, or it is four or five, which is good? So that's pretty much what we're going to be concentrate, what I will be concentrating today, and that's what the whole presentation will be circling around, and I promise you, you will see this table quite frequently. So part three, general principles. It's a whole page of general principles in the original guidance. The focal points here would be that the guidance is focused on a DNA reactive substances, which can, as it comes from its name, directly cause DNA damage. And um, they exist in very low threshold, they act in very low threshold and potentially causing cancer. Versus uh, genotoxicants, which are non-metagenic, they usually act by threshold mechanism and usually do not uh, pose so much of carcinogenic risk. And finally, it's the uh, first time, I think, in regulatory history when structure-based assessment were allowed to be used as a main uh, evidence. Before that, it was used in a weight of um, evidence approach or supplementary evidence. So the first question was, should non-metagenic carcinogenic impurities be controlled according to ICHM7? The short answer is no. The long answer is, this case, non-metagenic carcinogenic impurity do not fit in any of these cases in this table. It's not class one because it's non-metagenic. It's not class two because it's not unknown carcinogenic potential. It is known carcinogenic potential. It's definitely not class three because again, it's non-metagenic and absolutely uh, probably not class four or five because after all, our impurity is still carcinogenic. So what to do? The, this, uh, case is actually, according to the Q&A, is out of scope of the guidance. So ICHM7 class cannot be assigned at all, but if you still ins insist on assigning something, you can assign out of scope. So that's what can be written in the tables, in the results, in conclusions, out of scope. Uh, two examples which were given by the Q&A, it's acetamide and hydroxylamide. Both of them have non-DNA reactive mechanism of producing cancers, especially hydroxylamine. And um, for acetamide, it could be slightly more complicated based on this publication from 2004. But these two examples give you the perfect idea that you actually don't need to control this kind of impurity using ICHM7. If a particular impurity is known carcinogen, that means it was tested in a standard rodent carcinogenicity assay. And most likely, you have some toxicity values behind this test, TD50, like in case of acetamide, or maybe loyal or oil, which led to a lifetime PD development for hydroxylamide. So once you have those values, you can calculate using standard uh, formulas what is acceptable intake on what is PD. And you don't need any guidance to tell you what are the limits, because you actually can calculate it right from these toxicity results. So that's the answer. You don't actually need this impurity to be controlled by M7 because you already have all the information. It's out of scope. Um, more, more light can be shared to this situation by this interesting paper. There are a lot of papers about um, carcinogenic, non-carcinogenic, um, and non-metagenic impurities. This is just one of them. Um, it shows very clear difference between non-metagenic and non-genotoxic carcinogens. These are two different things. Q&A talks about non-metagenic. Non-genotoxic slightly different game. And actually non-genotoxic carcinogens, according to the paper and what you can read in this abstract, they actually can become actually genotoxic if you apply proper in vitro and in vivo assays. You can read more about this in the paper. I found it very interesting. Second question from this chapter. It's another way around. Now we have mutagenic, non-carcinogenic impurity. And is it, how does it fall under M7? Again, we're talking about the classes. Well, it's non-carcinogenic, so it's not class one. 
we do know about carcinogenic status, so it's not class two. It is mutagenic, so maybe it is class three. Maybe not. The guidance says, no, it's not. The guidance says, and actually reminds, the whole idea of this guidance was uh, to reduce uh, risk of carcinogenic impurities. So if we have an impurity which is non-carcinogenic, there is no point to reduce the risk any further. It's already non-carcinogenic, so it should be treated as a class five. And there is a citation from Dr. Zeiger which emphasizes the fact that not every mutagen is actually causing the cancers. It needs to undergo through additional replication cycles and changes before it actually become, becomes inheritable and it will produce a tumor. It may or may not happen. And um, one of the examples is propylene, which is AIMS positive, but not carcinogen. So if you have mutagenic non-carcinogen impurity, you are in a way in luck. It is class five. You don't have to worry about this. There is one question which is not in a Q&A, but a very frequently asked. Should we always test APIs and why and what M7 class to assign? Well, let's try to clarify this. Could we always uh, subject API to in silico evaluation together with impurities? The answer is yes. If, but there is if. If you have experimental, uh, reliable experimental confirmation of AIMS negative status for this API, you cannot just assume that API is negative just because you call it api or maybe it is listed in some pharma pharmapedia or something you need to have access to um, experimental results of aims publication your own test whatever you need to be able to prove that your api is actually aims negative then you can use it and you should use it for in silica evaluation for um, this particular reason for example which is established in this um, slide if you want to call something class four, you need to compare the alert which you found in your impurity with the alert which you found in your API. And the best way to do it using the software, you have both alerts highlighted like in this case, you can see that these alerts are existing in the same environment. So impurity E can be called class four, but do you really need to do the um, in silico evaluation? Maybe you can just do the visual comparison. That's the second question, which is very frequently asked. Well, think about it. If you do visual comparison in your report, you're supposed to say clearly that upon visual comparison between the API structure and your impurity structure, the impurity seems to have alert existing in the API in its exactly the same environment. These two pieces of this sentence, visual comparison seems to have, are very weak sentences versus we run both compounds, we identify alert number, let's say one, both of them are present in, uh, alert present in API and in impurity A, that E, that makes a greatest conclusion that impurity E is actually class four. There is no doubt here. You run both structures, you identify the alert, you know what is alert number, you see the alert um, location, and some of the softwares will give you more information, like for example, case ultra, it will give you alert environment similarity even so you can, quantify your similar environment and it's very solid evidence. So, and maybe using this logic, maybe using some other logic, but Q&A uh, question 1.2 actually clearly says that impurities should not be assigned class five based on visual comparison. We actually can apply the same logic, I think, to class four. So I would say you, if you want to have reliable, um, reliable conclusion about your class four always test the api if you have some other impurities which aims negative test them as well it might help, might help you even more and finally which class should be assigned to the api itself well it's all over the guidance but i'm just using the title of the table one from the chapter six it is impurities classification api is not an impurity so you can call mpi a negative or positive, whatever the outcome of your in silico evaluation, just don't call it any kind of classes. Classes are only for the impurities. So when we're switching to the chapter six, it's all about hazard assessment and again the famous ta table with five classes. And you can see that you actually can arrive to the assignment of the classes in two different ways. You can just perform database and literacy search for carcinogenicity and bacterial mutagenicity data. And it will allow you to classify one, two, and five classes. Or 
If that is not possible, then you actually can run the in silico assessment using available QSR with two methodologies. Of course, it should be focused on bacterial mutagenicity. I'm emphasizing that, not genotoxicity, bacterial mutagenicity, which is a little bit more narrow subject. And it will allow you to classify into three, four, and five. So questions related to this chapter and answers. Uh, if you use a QSR which is developed in house or not very um, famous, what? How do you prove to the agencies that this is a good QSR which actually can be considered? The answer is you should confirm that your solution, your software, and your QSR solution confirms with the five OECD principles of QSR validation. Define the endpoint, an ambiguous algorithm, no black boxes allowed. Define the domain of applicability, very clearly stated, properly validated, and ideally mechanistic interpretation, which is okay and usually happens for rule-based approaches, rarely happens for statistical approaches when you derive the alerts using statistical routines. And if you have a way to attach mechanistical interpretation, it's good. You usually can do it in your expert review. But not many models will allow will offer you mechanistical interpretation for the alerts if these alerts are statistical. How do you do it? How do you describe this all five principles, etc.? And there is no should. It's uh, pretty much um, clearly indicated. You have to use particular reporting format, QMRF, and it's all result of um, intensive efforts run by OECD QSR projects. So what is this QMRF? It's actually, usually, it's a simple PDF file with 10 sections. If you open this PDF file, it will look more or less like this. I'm just using as an example one of our uh, QMRFs. What is important to remember about this, out of these 10 sections, you absolutely have to have sections 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8 filled up because these sections are exactly talking about these five OECD principles. So they need to give answers. If you don't have these sections uh, filled up, well, this QMRF is almost as good as none. So make sure that these sections are there. And in other technical questions, where do you get this QMRF? Well, if you are um, a subscriber of the software, you usually get it from your software vendor. If you happen to use our software, KSalter, you will find it in this particular location, KSalter data folder. I just give a little screenshot. So you'll have a list of all the models provided and QMRFs right there. If you're using consulting services to come up with your report, you probably should ask the consultant to provide the QMRF to you. In other way, if you have something which is a little bit more famous or uploaded to a database, you can actually apply and check in uh, GRC QSR model databases for QMRFs. That usually happens with um, developers who would upload their QMRFs in this database. Some of them do, some of them don't. So maybe asking for vendor, asking vendor for QMRF would be a good idea. If vendor will not supply the QMRF or will refuse to supply the QMRF, maybe you should look for another vendor because QMRF is kind of becoming standard. Second question here is a little bit more complex. What to do with auto domains? Can we call it class five? No. I know it was a notion a couple of years ago, some of the companies, some of the vendors would recommend to call um, out of the main situations class five, but this is simply, simply and plain wrong. Um, it, you need to perform additional assessment. Um, there is another statement in Q&A which says that we know pretty much all about uh, DNA reactivity. So most likely your unknown structural feature will not lead to potential mutagenicity. Nevertheless, you need to do expert review to reassure. Well, yes, we know a lot about bacterial mutagenicity now. There is a lot of data out there. But a couple of years ago, we also were sure that we know everything about bacterial mutagenicity. And we knew at that time, or we suggested at that time, that aryl baronic acids are AIMS negative. Apparently, they are not. They were AIMS positive. Uh, so we don't want to be in this situation. I would say, you have an unknown feature, don't assume that it is negative. Even if somebody tells you, assume it is negative. Make sure that it is negative. Expert review would be the best. There is um, a list of options here, which I would uh, actually number differently. First one, yes, I agree. 
Just compare with structural similar analogs which are usually available from the same learning set of your model and for which you have um, AIMS data. It can be done in read across way, can be done manually, can be done with built in routines, for example. As case author has a consolidator routine which does it for you. I will not talk much about it because we had a couple of webinars uh, just about this. You can mm, maybe find them out or maybe we can repeat some of those webinars this year. If that will not work or if that will not give you the good results, you actually can use additional model. Uh, the only, con the only uh, suggestion is if you have problems with statistical model, you use additional statistical model. If you have problems with rule-based, you use additional rule-based model. That's not always the case, but I will discuss it in a second. And finally, the last option, when nothing else works, you can simply look at this particular fragment, for example, which is unknown, and just can suggest using your chemical toxicological knowledge, using your knowledge of mechanism of DNA reactivity, if this particular structure feature is going to give you troubles or not. Most likely, it will not give you any troubles, but you will still have to go and confirm it. So these are a few examples. First, we can um, classify out of coverage situation into two types, out of structural domain or in conclusion for equivocal. In the first case, you simply have a piece of structure which is not seen in your learning set. So you literally don't know what the structure means. In the second case, you probably have an alert which is not strong enough to give a, either positive or negative call. So it is in conclusion. In either case, you can leave it as it is. So what can be done about this? You actually can perform expert review of structural surrogates. So I'm giving this example, Sardex methyl phenidate which came up with this highlighted alert and did not give me any conclusive call. So it is inconclusive. And I run our consolidator feature. It gave me three of these analogs, which seems to be more or less similar to what I'm testing. And the alert environment is similar. It's quantified with this alert environment similarity figures. To me, it looks acceptable. So I would say three, alert, three analogs which contain this alert are negative. So I would say it's negative. I don't need to worry about inconclusive call anymore. Another situation is when we have inconclusive on or out of structural domain and we don't want to do expert review, we just want to run additional model. We, well, I'm just giving you an example of a case alter situation when we have our statistical model, GG1 BMUT, we have our rule based model, GT, GT expert, which are standard, um, which are recommended for regulatory use, and we have additional model farm BMUT with extended coverage. First query, both of the results give me auto domain. Farm BMUT extended coverage gives me negative result. What does it mean? First two models do not detect or do not contain that particular structural fragment which is causing out of domain feature in them. But apparently, this fragment is present in the learning set of farm BMUT and it's not affiliated with any bacterial metrogenicity. So the call is negative. For me, it's reassuring enough to give the final negative call. So whatever was out of domain was not in out of domain in a bigger model and it gives negative call. Fine, it's negative. Second example, statistical system gives me inconclusive results. I run it with another statistical system. It gives me negative results. So fine, we resolving inconclusive, we call it negative. And finally, third example, rule-based uh, system gives me inconclusive results. So the rule which was used in there was not strong enough to warrant positive on positive call and it was not deactivated enough to call to cause negative call so it is inconclusive then i'm running an extended coverage statistical model tells me negative but it means nothing in this case it does not address the fact that there is a structural rule and it needs to be clarified why it's doing inconclusive call can it be dismissed or can it be enforced you can use the same approach which, which i showed in the previous slide so you can do the uh, expert review of structural analogs. Finally, the, when nothing else works and you actually have to review your mm, auto domain, just to confirm that mechanistically it's not possible that this thing will be mutagenic. So it's almost 20 minutes. I will be wrapping up soon, almost slides. This is a very simple example. This is tree-like uh, structure on the left contains a uh, cyano group attached to two tertiary carbons in a row. In the same time, I have, in the same time, I have an AIMS negative analog, which does not look like this query compound, but in the same time, it's AIMS negative. Question is, 
when I'm uh, converting secondary carbon to tertiary carbon, is it going to change something much? From the point of view of simple um, chemical mechanism, uh, if you have structural hindrance, increased structural hindrance, your reactivity usually goes down. So whatever was AIMS negative already, so whatever was not able to react with DNA, when you increase the volume, when you increase the hindrance about this particular functionality, I don't think it's going to all of a sudden become DNA reactive. It's probably going to be even less reactive. So from this point of view, I probably can argue that this particular structure with highlighted red substructure is going to be AIMS negative just based on similarity in a way to known analog and inability of this known analog to become all of a sudden positive when we add a couple of metal groups here. So that would give you expertly viewed um, resolution of auto domain situation. That will meet with higher scrutiny from regulators. Just be ready for that. Um, 6.3, if it is AIMS negative, but cluster gene, for example, chromosomal aberration, what do we do with M7 classification? We don't do anything. From the point of view, DNA reactivity is class five. It's not AIMS uh, negative. You might need to control it using different guidances. And I've seen cases when people try to be very careful and they would treat the cluster genicity as potential liabilities and will just choose to control at class three. But this is their choice, it's not required. So it's class five and you need to check additional guidances to see if you need to control it according to those guidances. Final question in this section, um, clarify rationale of using in vivo follow-ups. Well, in a way, Victoria already answered that in 7.1, remember, if you have AIMS positive, but in vivo gives you negative results, it is class five. That's your rationale. You, you have a way to override in vitro test by in vivo results. You have a way to confirm clinical relevance or irrelevance of your AIMS finding. Not every AIMS uh, mutagen would be important. Many of them are, but not every one of them. After all, AIMS test is a test performed in bacteria, and we're talking about effect of human health. So in vivo test might help. That's the, that's the rationale, that's the reason to do investigation in in vivo in case if you are unfortunate enough to have AIMS mutagen. Finally, um, many times is asked, so it is known that QSR software is getting updated quite frequently. And are you supposed to update your predictions every time? Or are you supposed to just use something which you used 10 years ago and this is okay? So none of them is true, actually. Um, you're not supposed to, you're not recommended to run every time when you have an update, but it is uh, recommended to rerun QSR prior to initial marketing application to make sure that you have the most current data. And of course, if you use something very old before 2014, you absolutely have to rerun it because whatever was done in 2014 did not even ref uh, reflect the ICHM7 guidance. And uh, many questions in this regard were answered in this particular paper with a major highlight is the um, paper accumulated data from three software vendors, from uh, us, from LASA and from Litscop in the period of time between four and eight years. And it shows that changes from negative to positive are very small. And when you do, when you use several platforms, it's even less possible. So most likely nothing will happen from the point of view of bad and rather another way around. Whatever was out of domain will not be out of domain anymore. Whatever was inconclusive will be not inconclusive anymore. So it will be all good. And not necessarily to repeat QSR predictions every time, but final uh, verification would be very useful. With this, I will end my presentation and I will open the floor for question. Thank you very much for your attention.